I want to explore something with you, some thoughts with you and see where those take us. And this takes me to an understanding of what was happening in the ancient world at the time the Hebrew scriptures were being written that eventually came into our Bible as the Old Testament. In that day, superstition was rife in the world. So in ancient culture, there was a superstition that there were spirits, gods, whatever you want to call them, that were in some arbitrary way interfering with human life. And that they could get ticked off at you, in which case you had to appease them, or they could be in favor of you. And you certainly didn't want to fall out of favor. So there was this kind of mentality around the invisible realms. And so you had rites and rituals and sacrifices, all of which were about that. And in the worst of them, you had human sacrifice. People thrown off of pyramids and, and so on. All, all of which was to appease the angry, gods and to um well make it rain or whatever it was make the crops grow avoid cl the calamity of uh, tornadoes and earthquakes and so on so you can imagine a spiritual awakening in a group of people which is what was happening so for the Hebrew people, they were in a process of spiritual awakening. And they were coming to a higher understanding of what was going on. But do you think it's possible that some of this superstitious mindset would have come into what they were thinking? You might say, it'd be surprising if it didn't. It'd be surprising if it didn't. So in so many ways, what they did showed breakthroughs, all kinds of amazing breakthroughs, but it wasn't a breakthrough into ultimate enlightenment for, for them. That's a little unrealistic. They were, they were taking steps. They were things that were opening for them. And they carried over these superstitious attitudes. So if you read the Old Testament stories, they're like that. They are like that. You, if you know the story of uh, Noah, Noah's Ark, yeah, we think about the animals two by twos, but it was uh, of a ticked off God, like who'd had it. So he's, he's gonna flood everybody. If you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's the same. And so it goes. So you have the, the, the picture of a creator, of, of an almighty God, maybe a more enlightened version of God, probably so, than some of the more ancient versions, but still an arbitrary thought that takes it out on people for being bad. To some degree, the New Testament took it a step further, and Jesus himself. Um, Look at a step further. Not that what he was bringing was in its essence any different than what had been brought before. After all, spiritual awakening is spiritual awakening, and there's only one thing to awaken to. But he was working with it at a higher level. So why is this all relevant to us? It is because in so many ways in the culture of today, that mindset has been brought forward into religion and the faith of today. The mindset that there is an 
omnipotent creator who is doing things to us. Not that we ourselves are doing something as a creator ourselves that is having a fabulous impact on our lives and the world for better or for worse. No, it's all being done up there for better or for worse. I believe that that mindset has a profound impact on how we think of ourselves. And even if you're not buying into all that from a religious standpoint, nonetheless, in the culture of today, we tend to think like that. Now I wanna bring in something else. It's, I believe, related. I, I came to know a little bit about a theory of child rearing called love and logic. I heard about it from my daughter, from Elena, who's in the room here. And the little I know about it is that it's a philosophy based on the idea that punishment of children is inappropriate. We're not here to punish children. At, at the same time, there are natural consequences of anybody's act, actions, including a child. So while we're not here to punish, we're also not here as parents to remove the consequences of a child's action because that's fundamental to what it means to be a, a human being, an empowered human being. It's to understand that uh, there's a law of cause and effect. And what I do creates an effect for better or for worse. And how do I learn what creative cause is from me? I learn because I experience the, the effect of what I do. And so this theory of child, child rearing promotes that seems to me there's a lot to be said for it. And if you want to know more about it, you can talk to Helena after our service today. But my point is that in life, in life for us, what does it mean to be empowered, a truly empowered individual? How do we act as a creator with other people and in the world in which we live? Do we think it's our job to punish people when they're bad and pat them on the back when they're good? Or do we think that, is, that what is happening for us is outside our control? It's somehow arbitrary, whether we think it's from God or the government or uh, other people, uh, a company, a family member, or are we acting as an empowered individual? An empowered individual with, you know, who is wildly intelligent, who is learning and knows something of the code of creation, knows what it is to create, and who's not reacting to whatever is happening. If we think that that's what God is doing, if that's the notion of what God is, that he's reacting to us and what we're doing, isn't that setting the pattern for how we're acting, right? If I think God is doing that to me, then in the way I act, I'm, I'm likely to model myself after that. So I live a re essentially reactive life. What I'm getting to here is that a reactive life, life is a weak life. If you are reactive to other people, you, do, you are not in touch with the power of creation and the intelligence of creation that is yours to embrace. You're too busy reacting. And you cannot be the force in the world that you are meant to be if you are reacting. thinking about this for myself and then observing in my world, I thought of 
two ways that we as human beings tend to react that probably oversimplifies it, but maybe that's helpful for now. So one way of reacting to other people is aggression. Is it not? Like something happens to me that I don't like and I'm gonna, I react to it. I try to get back at them. I suppose you, you could call it the revenge mo motive. They did something to me, I'm gonna get back at them. It's aggression. There's another reaction, which is recoiling, right? Powering or recoiling. So somebody does something and inside we want to recoil, we want to get away from it, power from it perhaps. <laughs> I'm not saying that, that um, we don't need to pick our battles, if you will, as it said. So I'm not saying that we should not have a tactical retreat at times. I'm talking about the internal stance for us as a being. As a being, are we withdrawing into ourselves which, uh, out of fear, a fear reaction? So the, those are two ways to react, out of aggression or recoiling. But there's a third option. And the third option is to be present, to be fully present in the situation without any aggression and without any recoil. That is the way of power. That is the way of power. And now I'm free to create. I'm free to be wildly intelligent. Reaction isn't wild intelligence. It doesn't lead to creativity. It takes us out of being in tune with, with the intelligence that's available to us. It also takes us out of being open to the higher presence that becomes our presence. So in some way we become non-present present in a state of reaction. We're not totally there. There's a reactive sense of self or sense of self that's created out of the reaction. But it, it doesn't tap into the higher reality of who we are. 